Sada prelazimo na prvi blok našeg današnjeg programa gde ćemo se baviti najboljim praksama za dizajniranje Fast File Over, sistema za brzo porovak mreža u slučaju prekada koji mogu da nastanu iz raznih razloga. Imajte u vidu da predavačima možete postaviti pitanja na YouTube chatu na koje će se oni potruditi da odgovore u skladu sa vremenom koje nam bude na raspolaganju. Prvo izlaganje u ovom segmentu imaće gospodin Ivan Pepeljnjak. Ivan se bavi dizajniranjem velikih mreža za prenos podataka već duže od tri decenije. U internet svetu to je jedna zaista impresivna istorija koja seže u vreme mainframe kompjutera i analognih modemskih veza. Tokom ovog perioda Ivan je stekao ogromno iskustvo i primjerio ga u dizajnu mreža za prenos podataka giganata kao što su British Telekom, Deutsche Telekom, France Telekom, Tela i tako dalje. Radio je kao konsultant za Cisco, IBM i Hewlett Packard. Velika nam je čast i zadovoljstvo što je Ivan danas sa nama da nam pomogne da razlučimo šta je marketing, a šta realnost kada je fast file over u pitanju. Ivane, da li se čujemo? Čujemo se. Odlično, mi vas vidimo i čujemo. Izvolite, što bi rekli, the floor is yours. Hvala. Dobar dan. And copying Jan Žorš, uh, I will switch to English because I don't want to mangle your language. Uh, but, bit ću kratak. And you know what that means, right? Uh, I will dr drone on and on and on and on. No, I won't. Anyway, I'm supposed to be talking about fast failover on the network level, and they gave me 30 minutes. So it will be a rough and uh, speedy ride. And I'll skip this slide. Uh, if anyone wants to know more about what I've been doing in the past, just search me on the internet. Probably the first 50 hits are mine. Anyway. When I started designing large service provider networks, there was this magic figure, 50 milliseconds, that the vendors were desperately trying to reach. And it comes from the old Sonnet optical rings because they were able to wrap the ring around in 50 milliseconds. And every time a networking vendor would come out with a brand new magic unicorn based stuff that uh, would bring the world peace and profits to them. Uh, the old telco vendors would say, yeah, but 50 milliseconds, can you reach that? And of course, that's really hard to reach in the IP world, but the whole marketing machinery managed to persuade everyone that 50 milliseconds is the magic number to reach. And I was as stupid as everyone else and believed that this is the goal until I got my personal moment of truth. I was attending a PLNOG 11 presentation in 2014 and Ian Farrer from Deutsche Telekom explained how they were building the pilot uh, TerraStream network, which was piloted in Croatia and then they stopped that. I don't know why, so it would be really nice to know, you know, what was going on, but looks like they discontinued a very interesting and forward-looking uh, project. Anyway, uh, he explained how they are running IPv6 only and ISIS and BGP on top of that and no traffic engineering, no MPLS, no fast free route, no anything. And so, of course, my first question from the audience was, well, how do you reach the 50 millisecond convergence? And he said, well, we don't. But you know what? He said, the funny thing is that I was like you. I thought that we need to reach that. But then I started looking into our contracts. And I figured out that the minimum number we ever promised to anyone was 200 milliseconds. And we can easily reach that just by tweaking the ISIS timers. Lesson learned, before designing the network, you really should think about what is it that you actually promised to the customers and what is the target that you're trying to reach. When you know that, it's time to look at the big picture. And fast failover in a network is really a very simple question. After there is a change in network topology, how quickly can you find the alternate topology? How quickly can you flip over to the alternate path? Uh, and there are like several components that we'll go through first. How do you detect that there has been a change? Second, how is the change reported? And third, what happens after we know that something has changed? And after we know the answers to all these three, only then can we start asking the crucial question, how fast can we make it? And can we reach our contractual targets? 
However, before you start looking at vendor PowerPoints and miracle technologies, and I have an overview slide listing all of them, you really should focus on the big picture. Namely, what matters? So first, the question should be, how often do you experience failures? And I have a nice story from a large European organization. They came to me for some consulting and they said, well, you know what? Uh, we have like 100 different sites and we are experiencing daily failures. I was like, everyone is failing daily? And they were like, no, no, no. We have a link failure almost every day. I said, well, you know, if you have a link failure every day and you have 100 sites, that means that an average site experiences a link failure every three to four months. So maybe that's not that bad, but what's the impact of that failure? And they were like, yeah, some voice calls are lost. Okay, so some voice calls are lost every three to four months. Is that really something that you should spend your energy on? Like, maybe, but can we, you know, make the conversions faster? And I was like, okay, what's the acceptable convergence time? And yet again, they didn't know. And 50 millisecond in their case was totally unrealistic. And so we agreed that uh, they will start running BFD on all the links and uh, then after two weeks of monitoring, we'll sit down again and reconsider. So you, as a service provider, as a network operator, you must know the answers to the third and the fourth question. What is the acceptable convergence time and how fast is good enough? And obviously, a failure of a customer link, uh, well, a failure of a business customer link is totally different from a failure of a residential customer link, which and it's totally different story if we talk about core links. So optimize core links, the other ones, maybe not so much. Anyway, after two weeks, those guys came back and they said, this is ridiculous. This is so bad. Uh, we cannot live with that. We are losing a BFD session every hour or so. So obviously our network is not good enough. Uh, and my first question was, well, what did you set the BFE timers to? And they were using some really aggressive timers. And I was like, do you really need them? Remember, what is acceptable convergence time? And they agreed that maybe they overdid that. And then I said, well, increase the timers to reasonable values and we'll reconvene in a week or so. A week later, they had no failures. So always you have to figure out how fast is good enough. You have to figure out what is acceptable. And then you have to balance your urge to be fast with the false positives that you will get if you try to be too fast. And do keep in mind that if you're converging too fast, that will only make your network unstable. For example, let's say you have a flapping link that goes up and down twice a minute. And every time the link goes up, you converge onto that link. And every time the link goes down, you flip over and the traffic goes to another link. This only makes your network unstable. So be conservative. Network stability might be more important than the urge to converge in 50 milliseconds or so. Now let's slowly go into the uh, components of the convergence time. And there are generically three components. You have to detect the failure. You have to realize that you have to find the alternate paths. You have to find them. And then you have to update the routing and forwarding table. No one wants to talk about the first one. No one wants to tell you how they do the third one claiming it's their secret sauce. And everyone would love to sell you more and more and more complex solution for the second one, find alternate paths. As it turns out, the second bit that everyone is trying to optimize is actually the least significant one of them all. Remember the Deutsche Telekom lesson? 
they could converge in 100 or 200 milliseconds using just ISIS. Now, obviously, if you can detect the failure in a millisecond, 200 milliseconds is a long time. If you can detect the failure in a second, who cares about the additional 200 milliseconds? Maybe you should focus on that second. Which brings me to how are we going to optimize failure detection? And if you're really lucky, you own the cable or your devices are connected directly to a fiber optic cable. And then it's very easy to detect that the link is down because the light is gone. However, the light might be gone in one direction, but not the other, which means that now you have a unidirectional link. So how do you cope with that? If you're lucky and you are either connected to a fiber or a, a lambda, so you are connected to a bit stream, then with 10 gigabit ethernet, and I think also with gigabit ethernet, but don't quote me on that, you have link fault sigma link built into the ethernet itself that detects unidirectional links and all the other stuff. If you have to rely on something like LACP for port channels, the minimum you can get is three seconds. That's the fast timers. Cisco's UDLD is not much better. Ethernet CFM connectivity and fault management is not much better. BFD is an interesting one. It depends on how it's implemented. If it's implemented in hardware on the line cards, then yes, you can get to tens of milliseconds. If it's implemented in the CPU, then don't be too aggressive because any glitch overloading your CPU, like receiving a million routes from BGP, will slow down BFD and you might lose the links because the CPU is too slow to respond to the BFD messages. So be careful, as I told you already, with aggressive timers, unless the failure detection protocol is implemented in hardware on both ends. And sometimes it's really hard to get the information from the vendors, what actually is implemented in hardware and what's not. For example, one of the data center switching vendors had this nice BFD offload feature where they offloaded BFD into the switching ASIC. Well, it turns out that they didn't offload BFD, they offloaded the sending of BFD messages. So the messages were sent at regular intervals, but they still had to be processed by the CPU on the other end to recognize that the neighbor was down. Worst case, you can't do any of these. And then it's back to the routing protocols where the minimum you can get is a few seconds with something like BGP and uh, things like OSPF and ISIS now has faster timers. So you can get down tweaking the link state routing protocols to hundreds of milliseconds. Okay, that sounds nice, right? And then you realize that you might have something in the middle. You might not own the bitstream. You might have a third party switch or media converter or what have you in the middle, which means that all of a sudden, half of the mechanisms I explained on the previous slide don't work anymore. And then finally, you might have so-called gray failures, where, for example, BFD works great, routing protocol works great, but you can't get any customer data through. Or you're getting so many errors that short packets go through, but large packets are more often lost than short packets. So this all complicates failure detection, and we can't solve this in half an hour. There are people focusing on gray failures as a career and trying to figure out what to do. And usually there is no good answer. You need a monitoring system and someone has to make a decision outside of the network to shut down a link with gray failures. But just keep in mind that detecting failures is a hard job. The second hard job is optimizing the installation of 
changed routes into the routing and the forwarding table, the FIB. And it turns out that many low-end ASICs can only install a few thousand updates per second. And even high-end devices like the venerable Cisco Catalyst 65,000 or 7600 7, uh, could only install uh, maybe 1,000, 2,000 updates per second into the switching ASICs. So if the BGP table is a million entries long and you're able to install 5,000 entries per second, which is a pretty high number, how long will the convergence process take? So it's very important and networking vendors realized that a long time ago to optimize this process. And the only way to optimize this process is so-called prefix independent convergence, where the external prefixes really point not to the actual next hop, but to the BGP next hop. And the BGP next hop points to the actual next hop, which points to the interface, which together with the next hop points to the ARP table that is needed to send the packet to the actual next hop. So for example, in this picture, if B goes down, A can flip from B to C just by changing that right-hand box there saying B, it doesn't have to go through the whole list of BGP prefixes and changing the BGP next hop. Obviously, if E fails, then E needs to be replaced with something and things become more complex. And the really interesting problem here is that as you add more things like VPNs and MPLS and fast reroute and MPLS fast reroute and who knows what else, it always comes down to the question, what can your hardware support? Because if you have too many levels of indirection and your hardware cannot support that, then either if, your so if the software you're using is smart enough, it will still optimize something. Worst case, it will go back to being simplistic and replacing everything. And in that case, you will have the convergence speed you deserve. And it's really hard to get any information out of the networking vendors specifying exactly how their hardware works. In particular, if they're using third party switching silicon like Broadcom silicon, which is used in many data center switches, for example, because they had to sign such a crazy non-disclosure agreement with Broadcom, Broadcom that they cannot tell you what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, time to recap. What can we do? Well, if you want to detect failures fast, then BFD is probably the only protocol that is available on all media and in many cases can give you reasonable fast uh, failure detection. If you want to get into the millisecond range, make sure that BFD or whatever you're using is implemented in hardware. If you want to have fast failover, then the forwarding hardware must support some sort of prefix independent convergence. And if it can install alternate paths together with prefix independent convergence, then you have a fighting chance of getting really good failover time. Finding alternate paths is a nightmare. If anyone ever had to implement MPLS traffic engineering fast reroute, you know what I'm talking about. And then we have the IP fast reroute technologies. Loop free alternate is very simple one. And then you have the remote loop free alternate and topology independent loop free alternate and segment routing. And these things are just getting more and more and more and more and more complex because the networking vendors are trying to solve the problems of bad design with ever more complex technologies because, you know, complexity sells. If you have a broken design and you figure out you can't reach your convergence targets, there are two things you can do. Either you can fix your design or 
you can ask a vendor to implement a magic fix. And people prefer to believe in magic fairy tales from vendors instead of fixing their designs for whatever reason. So adjust your expectations and design your network accordingly. So set realistic targets, figure out what are the most common failures, and please focus on the common failures. The networking engineers love to focus on the most exotic possible failure and spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how to solve that exotic use case instead of focusing on the daily business and making the network run reliable every day. Second, design your network. And here on the right-hand side, this is the picture yet again from uh, the TerraStream design. They decided to use lambdas on that black optical ring so that every aggregation router had two direct links to two core routers. So the failover is a piece of cake. If one part of the ring is broken, the failover is immediate the moment you discover the lambda is gone and it doesn't even need the involvement of the routing protocol because the other path is already installed in the forwarding table because you have two equal cost paths. If you can't do that, uh, then, well, as I told you, identify the components of convergence time, focus on the largest one, optimize the largest ones, and please avoid the snail, snake oil of nonstop forwarding and stateful switchover and graceful restart and nonstop routing. These things are great in certain very narrow niche cases. If you want to deploy them to improve your convergence time, you will just waste your time. And finally, remember that triangles are better than squares and rings really suck. So try to design your network as triangles, not as rings. And that's it from my end. And I hope I'm sort of on time. And if there are any questions, uh, I guess I'm a bit over time. So just send them over to me via email and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Ivan. So far, no questions live, but if there are any questions, you saw all the email addresses, so you can write to Ivan. Uh, Dragi Ivan, hvala još jednom na ovom izlaganju. Hvala vama.